Welcome to ISKCON kind of Silicon Valley. Very happy to have you all here. And we welcome everyone who's joined us online from various places around the world here on this Disappearance Day of Haridas Thakur. First of all, we offer our respectful obeisances to the founder Acharya of ISKCON, His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, under whose shelter we're conducting our activities here at ISKCON of Silicon Valley. <clears throat> and if any of you are new here, please uh, let us know any way that you can be more comfortable. Please feel free to um, sit in any seat that uh, is comfortable for you. And if you have questions, uh, please let Mukharvinda know. He's the one wearing right here. Just wave your hands. He's our official host for the day. So if you have any questions or need anything, please let him know. And he'll um, make sure that you're taken care of. <clears throat> we have programs here throughout the week. And when we say programs, we're mostly talking about <clears throat> practice of bhakti yoga, which is really quite simple because it mostly involves hearing and chanting. It's in Sanskrit, it's called shravanam kirtanam, means hearing about Krishna and uh, speaking about Krishna. That includes singing and chanting. Now, there's a philosophy behind bhakti yoga that's very deep. Close that door. It really could be basically described as a study of the various qualities of energy that we find within the world. <clears throat> there are, to be very succinct, higher and lower energies. And we have our choice which energies to <clears throat> associate with. When we stay in touch with higher energy, then <clears throat> we get one result, and when we stay in touch with lower energy, we get a different result altogether. But when we go out of our way to be in touch with transcendental energy, that is especially, that is especially manifested through sound, and you'll find when you read the Bhagavad Gita and other wisdom literatures that come from the Vedic tradition, that <clears throat> when we speak of energy, the most consequential of all the energies we associate with is the sound vibration. It's a great, great consequence in the choices we make of what we listen to. Sound is creative, in fact, and the Vedas, from the Vedic perspective, the world is created by sound, the world is dismantled by sound, and also we attain enlightenment through sound. So it's a kind of a sonic theology. We also come in contact directly with the deity through sound. This is mentioned in the <clears throat> Srimad Bhagavatam, one of the great bhakti literatures, in which a sage, Narada Muni, says, Iti murti abhidhanina mantra murti amurtikam. He says, what is normally very hard to achieve or to see becomes simplified through sound, and especially, he says, through the mantra. So, man means mind, and tra means to deliver or to protect. So, those who know the science of sound vibration and of the quality of energy and its consequences, the consequences of associating with various energies, and who come in contact with the process of mantra, meditation, know that the mantra has a, a special quality. It, it is the specific combination of syllables through which one can transform oneself in a positive way. And so when we talk about programs, we include in our gatherings uh, chanting together, the, specifically the Maha Mantra. This we see on the screen here. So this says Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So Maha means great. And 
Mantra means the spiritual formula, the combination of syllables that are transcendental and come from a different stratum, a spiritual stratum. And then the words we see below in the red are the mantra itself. So I'll say and then you can repeat. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Hare Rama. Rama, Rama. Rama, Rama. Rama, Rama. Hare Hare. Hare Hare. So Hare means, O oh my Lord, O oh energy of the Lord. And Krishna means the all attractive the original divine source of everything. And the Rama means the highest spiritual pleasure and it also means a spiritual strength. Have you ever had a situation where you knew what the right thing to do was but you, did, you couldn't do it? Please say yes. yes. Thank you. <laughs> Happens all the time. There's a, a perpetual struggle between the higher self and the lower self. How does one overcome that? Not by one's own strength, but by the strength of Rama. And in the science of mantra, when we say Rama, and feel free to say it, Rama. we come directly in contact with the spiritual stratum, very particularly in the way in which we gain strength to not only make good decisions, but, but to be able to enact them. As well. I mean, the idea might come to my mind that this is a good idea, but then am I actually able to do it? <laughs> that comes from Rama. And this is what is called Yoga Balena, or spiritual strength. This is the most valuable kind of strength one can have in this world because it allows us to work from a higher perspective. We're seeing from the perspective of our ultimate good and not just our immediate good. And we also feel within our reach the impetus and the strength to enact those things that we know are good for us. So when we say the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra all together, it's a kind of a prayer because it's written in evocative form. Evocative really means prayerful. If you walk by any uh, high school nowadays, and you go by a group of kids, you'll hear them, or maybe junior high too, I don't know. Burlingame High School's near where I live. And then when I go for my walk, if it's school time, I, it's, kids are standing together, and inevitably when I walk by, I hear them saying, oh my God, 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 oh my God. So this mantra is very similar. Hare <laughs> uh, Krishna means, oh my Lord, oh energy of the Lord, please engage me in your service. This is a very simple uh, way of calling out. Oh my God. But, but this is more sophisticated. And so everyone in, is in some kind of a situation where he or, <coughs> he or she can call upon help, usually. And if you're not, then you're an illusion. So <laughs> if you get yourself in that state of mind by carefully considering what is my actual situation in this world, how precarious is the world, then you may see for yourself that, oh, I need help, and therefore you may very sincerely employ this mantra by saying, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Rama Rama, 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 Hare Hare. And now, the, the simplicity of the practice of bhakti is that uh, all that's required to have a direct experience of your higher spiritual self is to repeat this mantra and to, at the same time, be aware that you're repeating it because it's possible to do things without being aware that you're doing them. So to give your full attention, attention to the mantra when you're chanting it. And uh, as simple as that may sound, we find that it's a frequently asked question when we talk about fixing the mind on the mantra or anything else for that matter, because the mind has its own ideas and places to go, apparently, and all kinds of plans and stories that it runs 
constantly. So there is a practice to this, and that is that one organize one's life so that he or she, that we have time to, to say the mantra so nothing else is pulling us at the time. What I mean by that is to take some undivided time to chant the mantra and do nothing else. Don't do other things at the same time, like driving or you know, making pancakes or you know, taking care of a, the what? Using the phone, definitely, yeah. Be careful of that because that's a big rabbit hole you can fall into. And, and the simple act of putting aside any other kind of distraction before chanting will, will seem kind of restrictive. You'll see, because I want freedom, or my mind does anyway, to go wherever it wants to go at any time. Once when I was in New Delhi, I was at uh, <clears throat> the ISKCON temple. It has a very high vantage point because it's built on a hill, a really high hill. It still looks down into the, the suburbs of New Delhi. And <clears throat> I have no idea exactly what the scene meant, but I can just tell you what I saw and heard, and then you can figure it out for yourselves. There was one of the largest uh, hogs that I've ever seen that somehow... Uh, three big men were trying to um, catch and put into a rickshaw. And <clears throat> the, the hog didn't like it at all. The screaming, and it was a, from a, a long distance away, way up on the hill, was so loud and disturbing that I had to go look over the edge to see what was going on. And I couldn't take my eyes away because... It was just a fascinating scene <laughs> to see, try to catch a, the hog and put him into a, a rickshaw. It was odd, to say the least. But what really struck me was the intensity at which the hog didn't want to be separated from the ground. Now, after that time, I started to notice hogs more. Because, I mean, you'll see them here, there, and everywhere. You see more animals in India. In American suburbs, you only see one animal, at least domesticated, that's dogs. It's not, oh, cats, dogs and cats. And there's birds flying around and squirrels, things in, in, in our neighborhoods, but you don't see the variety of animals that see, you see in India, <laughs> even on the motorways. <laughs> you can be driving down to see somebody in a, in a Mercedes and then somebody else is, has a camel pulling there. They, they mix it up there. <clears throat> But in any case, I had a lot of occasion to start noticing hogs and how they, <clears throat> uh, what their motives are in life and how they, how they act. And one thing I notice is when they're awake is they never take their snout off the ground, ever. They keep it on the ground constantly because they're always looking for something to eat. That's their full-time, well, not full-time. There's other things. They also mate and defend their space. But their main thing is eating. And the reason that this hog was so disturbed was because they were taking him away from the ground where he just wanted to go on looking for stuff. And I won't go into that either, what he was looking for because <clears throat> they eat stuff that we can't eat. We'd die if we did. And then I thought about my mind being like that hog. It wants to do what it wants to do all day long. And it keeps its, it keeps its stature, uh, constantly looking for uh, <clears throat> garbage to eat, to consume. And the moment I say, you know, we're getting, we're going to go, we're going to concentrate somewhere else, the mind will start squealing, and you'll be able to hear it from miles away, just like that pig that didn't want its snout taken away from the ground, what to speak of being, you know, a 400-pound pig being put into a rickshaw. <clears throat> Our minds don't like it. So when Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita tells Arjuna that, about the process of meditation, which requires some focus, some concentration, Arjuna said, 
but that must be impossible because the mind is very determined, it's mad, and it's also fickle. It's constantly changing. So this is true. However, one of the greatest benefits we can derive in our lives is by taking a little time every day, undivided time, to tame our mind, to gently bring it to a sacred space. That is, physically and also internally. Deciding that now is the time when I'm going to focus just on, this, on these sacred syllables. And wherever the mind goes, I'm going, to I'm going to persuade it to come back and listen to the syllables. Now it helps to study what a mantra is so that there's some credibility. You build some credibility in your intelligence. You can understand that this makes sense. I've noticed that when I associate with different kinds of energies, even in, in different kinds of sound vibrations, it has different effects on me. So it stands to reason that there may be a way in which there's spiritual sound, if I even accept it theoretically, and just try it. Suspend disbelief for a while, and then try it repeating the mantra. That will work also, because the mantra has its own potency. It brings uh, to us <clears throat> the energies of the spiritual world, as I mentioned before, which give us spiritual strength. So our practice will grow. So today is a particularly <clears throat> good day to either renew one's practice of mantra meditation by making a special vow to improve the quality of one's chanting, and there are different ways we're going to talk about doing that, or by starting to chant if one hasn't already started, or to increase one's chanting. And the reason is today is the disappearance day, the day that Haridas Thakur left the world. Thank you. And he was known, Haridas Thakur, over 500 years ago in uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes here on earth as the Nam Acharya. That was, he showed by example how to live a life of chanting Hare Krishna. And in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it's also mentioned that Haridas Thakur was an ex extremely important member of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's entourage. He was known not only for practicing well, very strictly practicing, but also for teaching it to other people. So the statement that's made here in the Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita is that he's the greatest devotee because he not only kept his vows of chanting, but he also took the time to teach others how to chant. So when you put those two things together, you get what is considered by the author of Chaitanya Charitamrita and Sanatana Goswami and the great Acharyas as a perfect devotee, to do those two things together in one's life. It's, it's the holistic process of bhakti, teaching it and also practicing it oneself. Haridas Thakur <clears throat> joined Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Actually, even before he appeared, Haridas Thakur, who had been born in a Muslim family, had taken to the practice of chanting the Hare Krishna Man Mantra. And he was a, an associate of Advaita Acharya. Advaita Acharya understood the exalted stature of Haridas Thakur because he saw how attached Haridas Thakur was to chanting of the holy name. Now this is something that's mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And that is, if anyone is able to come to this ultimate conclusion that by repeating the sacred names of the Lord, uh, one understands this conclusion that this is the ultimate practice. Or even if one doesn't completely understand but's already taken to it uh, with the sense of uh, faith in the process. This is, uh, it's known uh, from the Shastra, from the scriptures, that such a person is highly evolved spiritually. Devahuti mentions this when she says, Aho Bhattashwa Pachato Garyan Yajiva Grain Vartate Namatubyam Tepus Tapaste Juvuhu Sasna Arya 
Brahmanatru nama grananti yete. This is an astounding uh, observation by Devahuti when she says that if somebody's chanting Hare Krishna, they, even if they do it a little bit, they're, they're not fully invested in it as a practice, practitioner of bhakti yoga, but they, they just say Hare Krishna, in fact, with a little bit of uh, faith. That person is known to have already graduated the Vedic processes, which are numerous and arduous also. And if that such a person has come to a very high spiritual stature, that's what she's saying. She's saying, aho, this is a wonderful thing. What to speak of those who study it and give their full attention to chanting? So Advaita Acharya, at the time, uh, 500 years ago, it was a very different culture in India. And people were extremely... Uh, conscious of where everybody else came from. So Haridas Thakur in Hindu society was not considered very well or not accepted. But Advaita Acharya, who was the great a teacher of the time, considered that Haridas was the greatest of all personalities, more exalted than the so-called Hindu priests of the time. Because he took from Srimad Bhagavatam this understanding that if somebody's chanting the names of God with sincerity and full uh, intention, then that person has evolved to the highest position. Just as if you see your friend that you haven't seen for a while as a high court judge, you might see him on television being vetted for the Supreme Court or something like that, then you can conclude that they went through law school because they people don't become judges unless they go through law school. They don't let you in with a high school diploma to, uh, to become a judge. And in a similar way, the Shastra says, if you see someone who is chanting Hare Krishna or even saying Hare Krishna, you can say it. Krishna. Then you can understand that that person has graduated. They've gone through all the preliminary studies of the Vedas and they've come to the highest position. Now, it also means that whatever past karma one has is burned up by the process of chanting Hare Krishna. How can this be? Because of the power of the name of God. Because there's no difference between God and his name. I'll say it again. There's no difference at all between God and his name. You could, and you can just say Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. <laughs> so the idea is when you say Hare Krishna, you're directly in contact with Krishna. And the utterance of the name is uh, absolutely the same. No difference at all between uh, being directly in contact with Krishna. It is being in directly in contact with Krishna. And if somebody's directly in contact with Krishna, then how can any kind of uh, karma remain. That becomes eradicated by saying Hare Krishna. What to speak of a chanting with uh, attention and, and uh, regularity. And so knowing this very well, Advaita Chari, who is a great scholar, then uh, during a very important ceremony which uh, takes place once a year, uh, the Shraddha Patra. At that time, when you're offering this Shraddha ceremony for the previous ancestors, you're supposed to offer the first ceremonial plate to the most exalted of Brahmanas, which means somebody in the Vedic system that is, has the qualification at the highest level of, of priesthood. And in that culture, at that time, Advaita Acharya took the Shraddha Patra, this, this plate, and offered it to Haridas Thakur. And he said, you're better than any Brahmin. You're at the topmost level because your full focus is in chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. So Haridas Thakur 
Haridas Thakur's main concentration every day was to perform this kind of bhakti yoga of repeating the mantra again and again and again and just listening. And if anybody's tried this, you'll, you'll find that it's a quite um, self-actualizing and uh, at once uh, internal process that the mind for a while may feel restless, it might, might want to go somewhere else, but as you continue to chant and remember that this is a divine process, you might start to feel uh, peaceful, that I think I'll just stay here. I think I'll just keep doing this because the mantra starts to have its effect. It starts to pacify the senses. The mind then uh, starts to look a little more deeply within the mantra. And the name starts to sound a little bit fascinating. And one of the symptoms <clears throat> that one can see for oneself that one is advancing in the chanting process is that the sound of the mantra sounds more interesting than any other sound. There are a lot of sounds that you can hear. Some of them are very, very irritating, like a child crying or whining is by nature meant to be irritating. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, they have, Prabhupada said this, they have a unique, um, <laughs> they're empowered, they have a, a city, a power a yogic city to annoy uh, by the way they, um, you know, because if you get on a plane and someone sees a little baby, then they go like, oh my God, can we change our seat? It's just by nature. It's different kinds of sounds have different effects. And <laughs> there are some sounds that's, that are kind of interesting, but mostly the, the mundane sounds, and I mentioned earlier, the, there are different qualities of sound. The sounds that are related to my mind and my body and to the, the material universe. Those kinds of sounds and my attraction to them are really based on how I've developed my, uh, what is the makeup of my uh, psychology and my physical body. Because it is uh, by attraction. I'm attracted to a certain kind of music. Like you all love country music, right? Country Western? Not so much. But if I was in um, Oklahoma or somewhere like that, they, they might say, yeah, we love country music. Uh, you like, uh, you know, I can name different kinds of music, and when I say the kind that you like, you, you know, you might go, yeah, I like that kind of music. Bollywood, yeah. Because it, it's part of my psychophysiological nature. I grew up in a certain era and in a certain family and culture. And when I hear a certain kind of music, and naturally, according to my conditioning, I like that kind of music. It's natural for me to be attracted. But what you'll notice by chanting a, a, a transcendental mantra, and very particularly the Maha Mantra, is that at first it's not very attractive because it doesn't really sync with my psychophysiological makeup. It's not something that, I'm, uh, that I like according to my vibration from the three modes of material nature. It's not in goodness, not in passion, not in ignorance. It's transcendental, so it seems a little out of place at first. In fact, when we go outside to chant, which is something we did just the other night, when was that? Oh my God, it was last night. Um, I think because we had that seminar with Radhika, it seemed like longer. This session is no longer being recorded. <laughs> That's good because this is secret. <laughs> when we chant outside, uh, people, of course, like the rhythm. And we've noticed particularly they, they like, there's certain beats people like more than others. If it's a very choppy, erratic beat, uh, they're not so much into it. If it's way too slow, it may uh, not attract them. But there's a beat we've found that when you catch that beat and you stay in it at a certain uh, tempo, uh, people come along and they, and they can't go away. They get 
trapped by the beat, but it's also the mantra itself. It doesn't sound like the rest of the sounds that are up and down College Avenue. There's a lot of sounds that people are listening for that uh, you know, they can pop their head in a, in a bar and does it sound like my kind of music? Nah, that's a country bar. Let's go on to the next one and then they'll listen. Uh, people want to hear that vibration that, that syncs with, with their psychophysiological makeup. When they hear the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra chanted by uh, people who are following a spiritual regimen, they're not out there to make money or something like that. It's not really a musical performance, but they're really chanting uh, from a deep level of spiritual realization. It, it has an effect. People listen to it, and you can watch their faces when they first get caught by the mantra. They're trying to figure it out. Wait a minute. This is different. There's a different sound, and I can't figure out why I'm attracted to it, but I am. And a similar way when we a chant for ourselves is a little more of a challenge because you're not sitting with a group of people. I like the analogy that uh, Radhika Raman Prabhu made today. He said uh, when he asked for advice from a senior devotee once, he told them that just like at Kumbh Mela, Kumbh Mela is a, an event that happens, uh, well, there are different Kumbh Melas than the Maha Kumbh Mela, <laughs> and millions of people come to these events. And they, they all want to bathe in the uh, confluence of the Ganga, Jamuna, and Saraswati all at the same time, at this particular time, because there's a benediction for it. So if you're in the crowd, uh, whether you want to go in or not, you'll get pulled in. <laughs> this is true even if you go to, uh, in Jaipur, Radha Govinda Temple, if you've ever been there for Mangal Artik, if you get in the middle of that, I mean, 3,000 people come from Mangal Artik every day, especially more on the weekends, but it, it's jammed every day. And you can be in the middle of the crowd, and when they bring the lamp out, they don't bring it around, but they just hold it from the front of the altar, and they hold it like this, and the whole crowd starts to move like that, and you just get picked up, even if you're big <laughs> and carried. So he said, you stay in the association of those who are already doing it, and you'll be carried in a certain direction. So when people come and they listen to the mantra, they'll feel that it's, it's a different kind of sound, and when we... we do it our, uh, in a group, it's a little easier to stay in sync and stay uh, listening to the mantra and appreciating. But when you're sitting by yourself, this is an opportunity to test yourself and see how can I bring my attention back to the mantra. And there is every opportunity in that setting to then become interested in the mantra. This is a really healthy sign for chanting the Maha Mantra, practicing this Bhakti Yoga. There's a way in which I might take up any practice but not actually um, do it properly. As an example, uh, a lot of people get a, a subscription to a, to a gymnasium, or health, they call them health clubs now. So health clubs, there's a lot of them here in the Bay Area. And so if you buy a subscription to a health club, does it mean that you're going to get healthier? No, I mean, you just buy a subscription. Let's say it costs $75 a month, and you keep the subscription. Surely you'd be more healthy by just having it, right? No. <laughs> no. Okay. Okay. Now you might go to the gym once in a while and walk in the door. And then let's just say, you know, you try, for instance, like they have weights, and you can lift weights. So you lift the weights, and you put them back down again, and then you might decide that, okay, lifting the weights, uh, that's a nice idea, but it's, it's a little too much work. So then instead of lifting the weights, you just go through the motions. <laughs> so this Chaitanya Charan Prabhu gives this example that we may take up the process of chanting. We may say, oh, I'm a devotee. Well, that doesn't mean that you're going to have the experience that you're looking for. You need to have a spiritual experience. It doesn't matter what religious group you're in. You have to see it for yourself. So now you, you hear, here's a practice. It makes sense. Sound vibration, higher quality, comes from the spiritual world. Practice yourself. Higher self against the lower self. Take time to challenge yourself. Hear the mantra. It could become interesting. And then we start to practice. But then after a while, we become lazy. 
and I start thinking that, well, you know, I'll chant, but I'll do something else at the same time. Or I really won't concentrate. I really won't try to hear the mantra fully. I'll just chant and do something else. This is very much like either getting a subscription to a, a health club and not using it, or getting it and then going in to the, to the gym and they're just walking around. Some people I, I've seen in, in health clubs, they just hang out all day. They get one of the towels off the rack, you know, put it around their neck and they walk around, hey, how you doing, Larry? <laughs> Did you see the game? You know, and they'll, they'll watch the TV for a little while and they'll walk around. It's like, I guess that's enough for today. <laughs> and then after, you know, six months, their friends say, you know, hey, I thought you were on a health regimen. You're going to get in shape. You know, I still see you got a huge belly and everything like that. Like, well, I am going to the gym. <laughs> so a similar way, we may take up the process of bhakti and the, the chanting. But if I... <clears throat> If I sit down to chant and then I think of something else, I don't give it an opportunity to actually focus on the mantra, what to speak of pray. Yeah, we don't get that much opportunity to pray except for when there's danger. Why wait for that to happen? It's a little embarrassing to have, have, an, have many, many opportunities to voluntarily pray deeply and then not take them and then be confronted with a, a situation where, now, okay, now I, really, now I really need your help. And all those other times, I, I didn't consider it. You get much more credit when you remember that you're in a precarious situation and voluntarily call out helplessly when you chant the mantra than when you wait until there's a dangerous situation. That's why the saint, Kunti Devi, used to pray, he said, please bring more trouble in my life. Because when there's disasters, that's when I really go deep into the practice of Krishna consciousness. So Haridas Thakur was known by Advaita Charya, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and all the devotees to be the best devotee because he was fully invested in chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. One of the qualities of Haridas Thakur that you'll notice when you read his story is his deep humility. In his previous life, Haridas Thakur was Brahma. And we know from the Srimad Bhagavatam that Brahma, because he has Ishwara Bhav, those who move energy around, they're very powerful. They have some Ishvara Bhav. That means they, they have this sense, I'm a controller. So when he saw Krishna in his pastimes in Vraj, and I know I'm speaking a little esoterically, but I'll bring to some lessons from this also, that he thought, how can this little cowherd boy be the supreme personality of God? And he challenged him through stealing away his friends and his calves. I'm skipping a lot of details. I told the story the other morning. But then he found out that Krishna, even as in his form as a five-year-old child, cowherd boy, is all-powerful. And at that time, he surrendered completely. And he really wanted to be in a situation where he didn't have that sense of himself as being a big controller, the creator of a universe and so forth. So Krishna fulfills all desires. And in his next life he came as Haridas Thakur, where he had no stature at all in the Vaishnav community. He was considered in the uh, Hindu society at that time to be basically an outcast. Actually, that's a relief when you carry around the sense that I'm something, it's very difficult. In fact, in the Gita, Krishna says, Nirmana moha jita sanga dosha adhyatma nitya vinivriti kama dvanverva mukta sukaduka samjer gachantya muda paramavyayam tat. He's describing how one can make advancement spiritually. And one of the first things he says is nirmana moha. Nirman. Nirman means. Man means I have a sense of myself 
as being the center of everything. Nothing runs without me. If I'm not there, it might as well not even go on because I'm the main person. Like people say in our culture, I'm the man. Or they'll say, no, you're the man. You're the man. So Krishna says, nirmana, don't be the man. <laughs> be the one, consider yourself a servant that I come to serve other people. I'm not the main attraction. Somebody else is in the center, not me, nirmana. So when I get that relief, it's actually a boon for my spiritual life. Sometimes it happens when, we, when we're severely uh, chastised. Like if some superior that we have respect for says, uh, gives us some very strong admonishment. Possible? It could happen. It could happen. It's a good, very strong admonishment. Then uh, all for, for a while, the clouds of nirmana, of, of man, I should say, clear. The clouds clear and I feel like, wow, I could really take shelter of chanting Hare Krishna. I could really actually practice spiritual life in this mood that I'm not something special. So Hari Das Thakur was like that from the very beginning, and he maintained that mood throughout his life. He wouldn't even go to uh, take prasadam with the rest of the devotees. He said, no, no, I'll, I'll take outside. I'll sit somewhere else. I, I'm untouchable. And he would go on chanting the Maha Mantra constantly. So I mentioned this as a, a day to renew one's vow for chanting. And considering vows, vows are so powerful. It's something that humans can do that, are, that is transformative. Decide what's a good vow and a reasonable vow. And then implant it. Make a stand somewhere. And you'll see that all the other influences in your life then have to adjust to that. That's how powerful a vow is. And it's necessary in the practice of any discipline to renew one's vows because when I take a vow and I start to practice, there's many ways in which my vow may become degraded. One of those ways is called entitlement. When I take a vow, then other people might say, oh, you took that vow? That's admirable. And when they see you've kept it for a while, then they might start to you know, appreciate you more and more. And then you might think, wow, I'm entitled to so much respect because I took this vow. And because of that, you might then become more hungry for the respect you get for your vow than the vow that you took in the first place, for instance, chanting. So this is something that the acharyas warn us about. Raghunath Das Goswami and Vishnath Chakravarti Thakur both say, say a similar thing. So don't feel entitled that because you're practicing in a certain way in a, or a certain level that you're entitled to respect. And another is very similar, I think they're cousins, is justification. And justification means that if you're not doing it properly, then you justify it by saying, well, because I'm chanting the mantra doing anything, uh, I deserve to deviate in some way from my vow. So, at intervals, when one finds a special occasion, like the disappearance of Haridas Thakur, one can then uh, begin again and think of ways in which to improve one's vow. So, let me just take a poll. How many of you here right now, no, I'm not going to take a poll. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do is um, turn to somebody next to you. And um, Mukharavind, you have to go around because you're the uh, hospitality agent for tonight. <laughs> and if there's anybody, you have to go in and see if anybody's new here that uh, you can talk to them about, you know, what is the Hare Krishna vow chanting and things like that. Okay? Okay. 
This is Mukarvinda. He's our hospitality host for tonight. I think we need one more hospitality host. Shri Antariksha. <laughs> the two of you. Okay, so now uh, just for a few minutes, I want you to turn to a person next to you. And I want you to uh, talk about uh, what ways you, you think you could um, improve your practice of spiritual life. And if you're chanting the Maha Mantra already, then you could um, talk about ways that you'd like to improve the chanting. Or if you're doing any spiritual practice, then you can talk about what uh, ways you think you could make a vow, if you decided to today, to make it better than it is right now. Does that all make sense, or do you have any questions? Yes, yes. Question? Uh, any, spiritual, any spiritual practice that you're doing now that you could improve? And if you're chanting already, if you've made a vow to chant a certain number of rounds uh, a day, that's a very sp specific thing that Mukarvin and Sri Antariksha will explain to you. If you don't know about that, you can raise your hand and they'll help you out. Uh, then you can talk about that too. And I'll give you five minutes to talk to your partner and... Um, just write, mention one main way that you're going to do it, and then uh, we're going to revisit, and you can share what your partner told you, okay? I said okay? Yeah. You sure? <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Our hospitality agents are coming around, too, just to assist you if you need any help.
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. Go Premanande, Tai Gaurari Bo, Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Tai Gaur Hari Bo. So how did it go? It went good. So if anybody'd like to share what um, vows, unless they're secret, if you made them secret, that's okay too. Because sometimes you, you just want to keep it amongst uh, your closest friends, or you just keep it to yourself. You're okay. Okay, sharing means caring. Let's hear. So we start here, then we go to Vijay. Here come the mics. And how was uh, our? How did our hospitality team do? Yeah. Good. So, in the intent of full disclosure, this is Shraddha Devi Dasi and Gandharvika Radha Devi Dasi. <laughs> sharing our experiences so um, she started with her experience but I, I realized that it was same as mine and so it was good because then we could discuss it more deeper um, so there was a time in life when she and I were both in the Nirman stage and Akinchana stage like that and chanting was very good at that time and so you know it was easy for us to sit down for chant remove all kinds of disturbances switch off the phone and things like that and then um, for her, after a few months, the situation changed uh, to what, like, I j then the man comes back, situation has changed, so the entitlement comes back, and then the chants are just like, I need to get it, th them done and over with it. And um, in my case, I was uh, saying that um, I don't even have, my situation changed, that I don't even have disturbances or meetings or anything like that to go to. That'll disturb, I, I get up really early in the morning and to do the chanting, but still the situation is still the same. Like, you know, mind goes here and there. So we really want to, to get that taste and that uh, bhava that we can, we should hanker that, you know, we can chant the same way as we used to chant earlier during the Nirman stage. And um, so, um, so that is the, the and, and then that we know chant that way and actually we should chant for the pleasure of Krishna. That if, you, if the chants are bad, then we always feel that, you know, it's not, I, didn't got, I did not get the bhava, it was not good for me, I did not get the enjoyment, rather than that we should ch change the focus to really chanting for the pleasure of Krishna. And so that's the prayer to Haridas Thakur today, that, that we, he, he empower us that we chant in that uh, particular way. And we had three action items that we will focus on, and one is that uh, while chanting we'll just do... <laughs> We'll focus just on one bead at a time. You know, let's go back to the basics, put our goals really small and achievable. And if we are fo able to focus on that, then we will go to next. And then while we are chanting, we'll focus on the hearing because, you know, pravishta karna randhina, it has to go from our ear into the heart, and that's how it will clear our, um, our heart. And which is the second um, point, and that was, you know, to, uh, to apply the shikshasa verses one, two, three, ending in, you know, Trinada Pisone Chena. And we will fake it till we make it. <laughs> and the third one was that uh, to con continuously remind ourselves, with we, um, we know that we'll, we'll be a failure, even at one beat at a time, and that the power of the holy name and um, that it'll forgive us uh, all the offenses. And then Krishna, you know, looks at the intention and not the action that, that we do. Wow, you accomplished a lot in a few minutes. That was really nice, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hari Bhav. Okay. Um, Vijay and then Sachin, Sachin and Nimai. Hare 
Hare Krishna. So, um, my next door neighbor is Chris, and um, he's had uh, he follows a different practice, not exactly Krishna consciousness, although maybe in the bhava he does, and we'll get to it. Um, one thing that he says that he can improve upon is probably throw more time at it. And he's gotten pockets of them. And I asked him, well, do you get time set vacation? He said he gets the time, but then they're never free because then he gets to do something more on those time. So he's looking for free time, things that cannot absorb him. Um, he's had touch with Krishna Conscious, him and his lovely wife over here. They've both been uh, around for about 16 years on and off. And they also visited Vrindavan. And they said when they were at Vrindavan, they actually got pulled into the social, like you talked about, uh, the crowd pulling it. <laughs> so that's when they really and live to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So maybe not. The, maybe what they're really looking for is not free time. They're looking for free push. Maybe. So that's my understanding. That's all. Do you want to say anything else? No. Very <laughs> helpful. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sachin Nandan. Hare Krishna. Uh, so uh, I had my partner, Akanksha. So she has come for the first time. She got the beads and hopefully she'll start chanting soon. Uh, so and that is, uh, and from my realization perspective, I always feel well chanting. It's uh, Damodar Leela is one of the most focused Leela. And uh, there is one incident where the milk is boiling inside and you just defocus from serving the Krishna and go over there. So then Krishna destroys the heart. The house is the same as our heart. You defocus from that and Krishna gives more purification. I don't want it. I'll chant more focusedly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's how uh, to, to maintain that um, in always in the mind that Krishna always wants 100% attention. He doesn't like even 99. So just focusing more on that helps. That was pretty good. Thank you, Sachin and Anima. And Welcome to, to uh, Chris and your lovely wife, Danny. Welcome, Danny. And Akasha. 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 Welcome. <laughs> Anyone else have some vows, intentions? Malini. Again, we're thinking of ways we can uh, take advantage of Haridas Thakur's uh, mercy. It's his disappearance day today. Since he's known as the one uh, who kept vows so well. In fact, in the pastime of him leaving this world, it's mentioned in the Chaitanya Charitamrita that when Govinda, who is Mahaprabhu's, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's servant, who would every day bring a prasadam, he, actually the remnants of whatever Mahaprabhu left, he would bring it to Haridas Thakur. That was the tradition. So he brought the Mahaprasadam, and Haridas Thakur was lying on his back chanting. And he said, I can't take prasadam today. I'm going to fast because I haven't finished my rounds. And Mahaprabhu had then suggested that, you know, you're old now, you're ill. Uh, no need to keep up the rounds at such a level. But Haridas Thakur said, I'll tell you what my real desire is that I leave the world before you do. If I can't finish my rounds, I'd, let, I'd like to give up my body like the yogis do. If he didn't say it that, like, but he had that power to leave his body when he wanted to. So he was an exemplar of keeping his rounds. And that was at the end of his life when he couldn't, he, it wasn't uh, worth it for him to live. So this sort of fulfills what we found from Jagannath Das Babaji Maharaj too. He told those, of, those who came to him for shiksha that you should complete your daily rounds no matter what, even at the cost of your own life, and make sure you finish. With that, go ahead, Malini. <laughs> <laughs> it was so nice for the class. Um, I was also remembering Siddha Bakula, um, Haridas Thakur's place where you used to chant. Um, I was talking to Natalie, she had to leave, um, but she was sharing how she chants, she, I mean, she sometimes chants 16 rounds a day, sometimes four, sometimes two, sometimes none, and she would feel very terrible after the day when uh, she couldn't chant any rounds. Um, so today she wanted to take a vow to have a consistent chanting of at least 
16 rounds every day. And wow. So I was just inspired by what, what she said also for steadiness and consistency. And I was also sharing with her that um, for the past um, couple of days or a week, I was also meditating on how I can improve my japa. So I just um, started a japa journal for my, for my own self. And the moment I noticed that my mind away f went away from the mantra, I make a note um, of it on my, on my phone. I put a voice recorder, I just say, and I just make a note and I just say why it went away, like cooking, and I just, just put words like that, mm -hmm. why it went away. And um, first few days when I saw the journal, I felt so embarrassed <laughs> 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 to see how many times my mind went away. And, I, and until I wrote it down, I didn't even notice that it was going away so much. Um, but um, slowly, slowly, like every day, I see that the number of times I note down is getting lower and lower. But still, like, there's a lot of things why my mind goes away. So I just wanted to stay focused on the mantra and pray to Haridas Thakur um, to give the strength and empowerment to do so. Very, very nice. <laughs> Thank you. In the, the Harinam Chintamani, which is a conversation between Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Haridas Thakur, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was asking his devotee, the Nama Acharya, how to perfect one's chanting. Haridas Thakur mentions that one has to be inventive to find ways to bring one's mind to the mantra. For instance, he says, put yourself in any situation where you can hear better. He talks about sitting in a closet, uh, if you have to, or putting a chutter over your head, uh, sitting in the association of other advanced devotees who are chanting and so forth. And this uh, idea that you had of mapping where the mind's going, keeping a journal of it, is another way of bringing awareness to the fact, I'm chanting now, that's what I should be doing. And anything but non-awareness, because that's the enemy of the chanting, because then I'm doing the weightlifting with no weights. And I'm not making advancement when I'm doing that not trying to bring my mind back to the mantra. When I'm trying, then I'm in the stage of clearing. Prabhupada uh, put it that way, that there's an offensive stage, a clearing stage, and then a pure stage of chanting. And when I'm trying to remember that I'm chanting and be aware of it, then I'm in the clearing stage, also known as Nama Abbas. Yes, we have one online and then Leka. So before I read this, Maharaj, I just had a little comment on Malini Mataji's narration that there was a little kumumela happening over there. <laughs> she carried, <laughs> she carried Natalie to the to the figure of sixteen. Oh, well, who wrote that? Uh, no, no, I'm just I'm commenting on Malini Mataji's oh. narration. So I'm saying there was a little kumumela going on over there, where Natalie Mataji got carried along to a to a goal of sixteen. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And this text is actually from um, Bhakta Adam. Oh, from Bhakta Adam. Yeah. Nice. So he's saying that I've been dealing with a cold this past week and found myself trying to justify some slackness in my sadhana because of my cold. Well, I might as well just keep ha having to catch myself. Like being a little sick doesn't mean that you don't take time to chant with full attention or read your chapter of Bhagavad Gita, etc. So yeah, it's a nice good time case. to practice because... Oftentimes when we're leaving the world, uh, it's, you know, we may be compromised, I mean, to say the least, actually. But there's ways in which leading up to that point, we may, our physical, mental state may be compromised. It may be a lot harder. So when we have a cold or other kinds of things, if we continue our chanting as we do, it gives us, we can cross beyond it. One um, really nice instance of this was in Keshav Bharti Maharaj's recent uh, Vyasa Puja offering. Do you remember that? He wrote about how I was connected with him. I'm always connected with him, but uh, I was talking to him regularly. He had typhoid and he didn't know it. And then he caught it when it was a little bit far along. And uh, he almost died. It was very close. And uh, at, at uh, 
the most intense part of that, he went on to do his uh, reading of the Bhagavatam, and he f found a, a moment of complete lucidity where he had, uh, although he was so much compromised physically, he went on with his, his spiritual practice. And then Krishna gave him this insight that, okay, uh, it doesn't matter, I'm not my body. And he, he felt liberated from that situation altogether. And it was a very powerful and lasting impression. So oftentimes when we are compromised, we're in a situation where it seems like uh, it's diff more difficult to chant. If we go on doing that, there's a fruit at the end that can actually bring us to the next level of our chanting. Now, Leka. Um, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, I just want to discuss um, another method that I've found to be very useful for chanting. Like um, whenever I chant, uh, when I started chanting, I figured out that my mind was is just an absolute monkey. It was not there at all with with my chanting. So um, I play uh, Shila Prabhupada's Mahamantra YouTube video. That's like ten hour video, and then I put on full sound and I chant along with. Um, that way I've, I've actually found that it, it's more effective and more efficient and I'm more conscious with the way I'm chanting um, 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 Mahamantra. Nice. Yeah, and this is something that uh, in some, many temples they'll have the uh, audio recording and it can be very helpful to have that support. Gandharvika and then Bali. It's just um, this quote that you put on your Facebook, I printed and made a plaque out of that, which helps me focus because it's, it's a nice one. It's, you said that uh, it's not by working hard or by accumulating wealth that one may find satisfaction in this life or the next. Rather, it is one's purity of purpose and diligence in repeating the transcendental mantra received from the bona fide spiritual master that fulfills all of one's desires. And then you quoted, O Brahma, do thou practice spiritual association by means of this mantra, then all your desires will be fulfilled. Brahma Samhita 525. So this gives me, like, seeing this while chanting gives focus, that all desires will come from the holy name. Yes, it's important for controlling the mind because ultimately everyone's self-interested. However, my self-interest is misplaced when I think of getting some material asset. However, when it's spiritual assets I'm after, then the ambition that I have to, 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 to attain those becomes um, properly aligned and I feel happy. So human life is really meant for yagya or uh, divine investment or sacrifice. And by doing that, then one actually gets real wealth. And if I'm thinking like that, there's nothing else to be had, as Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, anywhere else besides the holy name, then I'll tend to be focused, because I think I can get it here. Anywhere else, I'm losing, right? Bali Prabhu. Because we know from Chaitanya Charitamrita that not only the human beings, but the animals also get benefit, and they also hear. And that is the testimony which Haridas Thakur gave when he went to a village and he was chanting on one of the cave in a nearby tree and uh, the villagers used to come but lately they noticed that there is a cobra which is residing along with Haridas Thakur but Haridas Thakur was not disturbed presence of cobra or any animal which is still he was going on his chanting but when villagers noticed they are a little bit uncomfortable sitting chanting because he understood their mind is our conscious of the cobra, then the hearing of the chanting. So after that, the petition that, you know, either we have to remove you from this place or remove the cobra. But when they talked about this, Haridas Thakur appealed to the cobra, I mean, before, then the cobra came out from the escape and he paid obeisances to Haridas Thakur and he left the place. So that is the power of a pure chanting that you don't need to disturb any violence rather than by the submissive approach they also hear and they become purified. Yeah, pro thank you very much for that story. Prabhupada talks about in the second canto how when one's chanting the holy name because we're connected with our original divine source, he says that all the energies are synchronized at that point, meaning that whatever is necessary for us in our life comes to us naturally when we're doing the pure chanting. This is uh, the essence of faith 
as mentioned in the Chaitanya Charamita, Shraddha Shabde Vishwas Kohi Suridanya Shoy Krishna Bhakti Koila Sarva Karma Krita Hoy. That when I have this sense that I'm watering the root, that whatever I'm giving to Krishna in the way of chanting, in the way of my bhakti practice, is nourishing me and everybody else. Nothing else needs to be done. And this is uh, the sense that one gets when one has this synchronization of all energies that are coming from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. We'll take one more from the internet and then one from Manava Govinda. This is Sundarananda Prabhu. Sundarananda. So he says, I was thinking of how Haridas Thakur kept his vow to chant and determination despite the allurement of Maya herself trying to distract him. Yes, and it's one of the techniques he taught by his life. Because oftentimes when there's a saintly person, other people feel envious that a person is able to control his or her senses. So this was the case in Benapul, uh, where Haridas Thakur was chanting, and the police chief there didn't like him because for various reasons. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons people can come up with for not liking somebody, but he felt that this person was a traitor to his own religion because the police chief was a, a Muslim and he thought, well, this person's chanting Hare Krishna, he must think he's a Hindu or something ridiculous like that. And then he thought, why should he get so much attention? This is the very essence of envy. So he came up with a scheme to prove that Haridas Thakur was not actually a saint. And he wanted to make him uh, give up his vow. So he paid off a prostitute to go there in the middle of the night, because Haridas Thakur would chant all night long. And he stayed in a little hut just outside of town. So the prostitute went there and petitioned him. And Haridas Thakur had a unique way of dealing with her. He didn't say, go away. Uh, he didn't ignore her. But he acknowledged her, and he said, okay, I understand you're here, but I have a vow to keep. And as soon as I finish my vow, then we can be together, okay? And she said, okay. So he stayed all, she stayed all night long. And in the morning, he said, I didn't finish my rounds yet. He said, you come back, you know, we'll try it again tomorrow. So she came back the next night, and he said, okay, as soon as I finish my chanting vow, then fine. And the next, the sun started to come up, and he said, I, I wasn't able to finish either. I have to keep chanting, sorry. And by the third night when she came back, she was starting to feel affected by the power of his chanting because when you listen to a pure devotee chant, there's a transformation of heart that takes place. So she then admitted to him, you know, I came here with a really bad intention. I was put up to this. I was paid off to um, make you look bad. And Hari Das Thakur said, oh, I know that. But I wanted you to stay and hear the chanting. And she became his disciple. And there's a picture in the Chaitanya Charitamrita after he gave her instruction to go and sit in front of Tulsi and chant. She actually shaved her head. And she would just take up the simple process of bhakti by worshiping Tulsi and chanting the Mahamantra. And she became a, a famous follower and disciple of Haridas Thakur. So this is one of the ways when we're chanting and our mind comes along and says, oh, by the way, you should do this or that, or offers you some other activity, then you can say, okay, no problem. As soon as I finish my japa, then I'll, be, then I'll, I'll get to you. And just as uh, there's a law in, in accounting, those of you who have studied accounting, it's called the law of diminishing intent. This, this especially applies to the collection department. People intend to pay you back, but the, there's, a, there's a, a formula that shows the longer you wait, the less they, they intend to pay you back. <laughs> the law of diminishing intent. So uh, if you put your desires on hold and say, yeah, I'll get, I'll get back to you after I finish my vow, usually they take a hike and they don't come back. They, they, they weaken and you strengthen because you go on chanting. Yes, Madhava Govinda. Hare Krishna. Priya Kishori Mataji was sharing her uh, vows, what she wanted to take. She was telling that uh, she wanted to wake up early during the Brahma Morta time and try to chant every day and also to read at least something before uh, 
in the morning time before going. That's very powerful. This uh, getting up earlier means you have to go to bed earlier, and then everything changes, right? <laughs> and that one th thing I've mentioned many times, but I'll say it again, it's just oftentimes when I know that I want to read a certain thing when I wake up, as I arrange it uh, on my desk the night before, and I even put post-its on it saying number one, number two, number three, number four. So I have four things lined up when I wake up. And that way I know, okay, nothing else until these four things are, are out of the way. More. I was, uh, sh I was sharing about uh, my experience that I wanted to take a vow that I chant all my 16 rounds without distraction. Like I generally tend to use my phone or try to get distracted by that. I wanted to avoid that. That was one of my things. Yeah, yeah and that, um, that may take some weaning. I know uh, there's uh, one devotee that I had been talking to, and she felt very distracted in her japa, and I asked her why, and she said, because my phone's always buzzing and ringing. I said, well, where do you keep it when you chant? She said, right on my leg. <laughs> and I said, um, could you move it, you know, and maybe put it in another room, and that was a big discussion. But she did it. To her credit, she did it. And, you know, she'd call me back and she would say, you know, I, I made it today for like half an hour because, you know, she, there were pressing matters there. It wasn't all whimsical. There were family things that she wanted to keep up on. And, and uh, it, it requires, when you make a vow, it requires sometimes some incremental, um, doing it incrementally so that you can come to that point. But then she came to the point where she was able to actually turn her phone off and leave it in another room. And then it changed, the japa changed. So these obstacles we have to deal with very practically because it's not like they'll just go away on their own. When we make a vow and then we have to see how do I overcome the obstacles. And yes. A question. Yes. Uh, we are talking about the sense, having a sense of entitlement. That when the, how do we differentiate the sense of entitlement or it's a responsibility that uh, one thinks that, okay, I have, I'm responsible for a particular thing? Well, the main responsibility is to finish your rounds. So if it competes with that, then <laughs> it's... In terms of other, other times as... Like what? Like other times when uh, we may start thinking that, Okay, I'm supposed to. Uh, well, Krishna take up says in the Gita, you have a right to perform your prescribed duty, so you can feel entitled to that, but you're not entitled to the fruits of your action. And also, he said, don't be attached to not doing your duty. So you should find out clearly what your duty is, what your service is, and then feel entitled to do that. Similar to what I asked Radhika Raman Prabhu today, because he was talking about taking. I asked him as you mentioned in class about when you take responsibility for things, you take on some of the karma of the, uh, of the situation. And, but he clarified that if you're doing it for Krishna, then the karma is already eradicated. So you have to make sure that you're lined up properly to do your service. And now, um, yes, last thing from Malini, and then we're going to do one other fun group exercise. Regarding what uh, Mother Govinda Prabhu was saying uh, and what you were mentioning about the um, um, first duties to chant, um, in the story of Kardamamuni and, um, and, um, and Kapila De when Kapila Dev comes, and as soon as Kapila Dev comes, uh, Kardamamuni says that, you know, um, now I have to leave because I have to go and meditate. So in that uh, put put um, it's mentioned that even though Krishna was present right in front of Kardamamuni, he had to leave. <laughs> so in that <laughs> section... I've got to do my rounds. <laughs> 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 in that section, Kapiladev mentions that whatever is mentioned in the Shastra has to be followed. Or, um, so it just reminded me of that section where the duty is first. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's important to talk about because it's easy for the mind to justify away our, our strict vow. And one of the ways that we help each other is by remembering how important it is. I was, I forget what city I was in, but there was some devotee there that we were uh, going to different Sankirtan spots with. But he, he was very intense. And every time he'd jump in the van when we're driving somewhere else, he'd immediately open the book, immediately start hearing and chanting. 
It wasn't a second wasted. And then I was sitting there thinking, come on, I got to move up to, you know, to a higher level. He inspired me. And when we're in the association of devotees and we see a higher standard, it reminds us uh, that it's easy to drift. We do naturally drift unless we stay in the association. So now uh, it's very important in a community for uh, devotees to uh, know one another. And so I'd like you to just take another five minutes to uh, find somebody here who uh, you haven't met yet. Because oftentimes you see people come in, you can watch them coming and going for a week, two weeks, a month, a year, three years, could be even 10 years. And you go like, oh, I wonder who that is. So now's your chance. Don't you dare talk to a friend. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, I'll come over and... and uh, but if you would just introduce yourself to somebody that you haven't met yet, then uh, we'll, we'll reconvene back here for, for one more uh, chanting session. Are you ready? Everybody say yes. yes. Okay, go for it. Feel free to move about. And our two hospitality specialists are here. If you, if you need any help with introductions, Mukara Vind or Sriyanta Riksha will help you.
see the purport. What? But there's like a number of verses, 99. Get my car in. Is that at the right um, pitch? Try the high end. It's too high. Is that too high? That's too high. Okay. Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Everybody please chant. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. I go pray manande Did anybody meet anybody new? Yes. He did, huh? Did you like him? Yes. Okay, good. That's nice. So, uh it's good in a community to help each other. That's why we have communities. So, if you see anybody around that you can um help or be helped by, then take advantage because these are centers for uh, higher consciousness, developing Krishna consciousness. And the best way to do that is stay in touch with people that you see are advanced in the science, and then you'll advance very quickly. So we've uh, spoken a little bit about Haridas Thakur today. He's one of the great Vaishnavas in our line that is thought of regularly for our own purification. In fact, when we say our special prayers called the Premadvani, when we call out at the end of kirtans the various names of the luminaries from the Vaishnav community, then we remember Haridas Thakur. And these things happen by Krishna's arrangement. I was thinking recently about our uh, devotee Jayananda Prabhu, who was one of the early devotees in the Krishna consciousness movement and uh, passed away before Prabhupada did. And he was uh, very much devoted to serving in the Krishna consciousness movement and very attached to Prabhupada. And he left the same year Prabhupada did, but before him, and was... Uh, afterwards given the position of uh, the only devotee that we have actually in our Krishna conscious movement that uh, we celebrate the uh, disappearance day of the, that is from the from the inception of ISKCON and he's become noted because Prabhupada noted him he pointed him out and said we should celebrate the day that he left the world because he attained success and um, how do these things happen by Krishna's arrangement? So when we have 
the names of Vaishnavas and we know about their history and their uh, practice of devotional service, just by remembering them, then we'll become helped in our own practice. Ajastra smara smarare, Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, just remember these great devotees, always remember them. So I recommend that you write down whatever vows you had considered today or spoken about, as once that you transfer them to writing, they start to take on a lot of deep meaning. And uh, if you make it available so you can see it every day, then it'll be a driving force. Today also outside we have our Japa meditation, our mantra meditation tent. And if you haven't started chanting yet and you'd like to, you can meet the devotees out there in the tent. They'll give you a free Japa lesson. And if you're already chanting and you want to increase, you can also go there too. It's a nice experience. Just pretend, even if you've been doing it for a while, that you're starting over again. It's good to be in beginner's mind. And thank you very much, all of you, for coming out here today for the Sunday program and all of you who have joined us online from various places around the world. We're now going to transition into a very uh, joyful, and boisterous uh, part of our program where there's singing and dancing. So we're going to clear out all of the uh, asans or the seats and put them, stack them neatly. And then we're going to uh, roll up this rug, move everything out of, the out of the way so you have a full facility to dance to your heart's content. And then we're going to sing before the uh, Lord Sri Sri Radhamanan Mohan. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Srila Haridas Thakur Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki